a list, a list, yes, another list. Welcome, guys. I am the Philadelphia Whovian, and now we're going to be doing a series of videos of m listing and ranking the stories of classic Doctor Who writers. Because, like, with New Who, like, you know, of course, like, you know, there are a lot of great writers, there are, and some not so great. Um, but with Classic Who, Classic Who set the foundation for the show, understandably. And without a lot of the contribution of these writers, there would have been nothing for New Who to revive. And we're going to be doing a series of um, writers like Robert Holmes, ranking all of Robert Holmes' stories. Maybe even Terry Nation in the next video, and David Whitaker in the video after that, Terrence Dix, Malcolm Hulk, and maybe even Bob Baker and Dave Martin. Now... After I do this video, if there are any writers that I'm forgetting who did a lot of stories, um, could you please let me know? <laughs> because uh, there are some writers who probably... Because I'm doing, you know, lists of people who did at least five stories. And if they did not do five stories, then I'm like, oh, I don't know how to list that. So if you could tell me, hey, this writer also wrote like five of these stories, just thank you for letting me know in the comment section and helping me out. So we're going to begin with one of my favorite writers from classic Doctor Who, Robert Holmes. This man contributed so many scripts. He's a writer, but he was also a script editor as well. And he contributed so much good writing to Doctor Who. I really don't think if there was no Robert Holmes, not only would Classic Who not have been as strong as it was, but I'm not even sure New Who would even have a remote, tra <laughs> a remote chance of being possibly good without this man. He was a genius. A sexy beast. When I say sexy beast, I mean he's a handsome guy. I'm mostly talking about his writing being so good that it was sexy in the sense of just it's so awesome and... Okay, let's start the video without me doing any more of that stuff. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, now, starting at number 18, we have The Brain of Morbius. Now, this was a script initially written by Terrence Dix, and Robert Holmes came in and rewrote it. And it's a prime example of what could have been, like, what was Terrence's original script? Uh, Robert, did you improve it? Did you not improve it? We just don't know these things. And so it's going to be kind of a lone list for me because of what the could have been and what should have been. And guys, I should also say, with this list, I should have said before, I'm not going to talk too long about each entry, just so this list is not very long of a video. Now, I believe we have number 17 now, and that's um another, um, we're going to the last story of the sixth Doctor, and that is The Ultimate Foe. Now, Robert Holmes, in the part that he wrote, I think he did a very darn good job. I really do. And I love the idea of the Valyard as a villain. But here's the unfortunate thing. Robert could not finish it. He died before he could finish the story. And I just think it's amazing. Him, like, in his last hours of, like, not hours, but last days of being alive, he was working on this script. Very touching. Very touching. But he didn't finish it. Uh, another writer had to come in and finish it, and so it's all about the what could have been when it came to how was he going to finish that story. Next one we have, I think we're at number 16, but I could be very wrong with number 16. I'm very bad at listing things. I'm just going to stop numbering things. We have the six doctors, the six doctors, First story of his last season, The Mysterious Planet. Now, Mysterious Planet has a lot going for it. It's got a lot of good elements here, here, and here. Oh, God, I love the look of that ship at the very beginning. And Robert gave the Sixth Doctor some very good lines. He really did. And overall, I do like the idea of it. It's just simply not my favorite Robert Holmes story, so that's where it fell. And now, next up, we have from the Second Doctor's last season, The Space Pirates. Okay. The Space Pirates has a lot of good going on there, but it's simply, I believe, unless I got a bad download, it's not complete. And it's one of those stories where it's, okay, it's perfectly fine and serviceable, but it's never going to be your favorite story. Again, it's got good elements to it, it's just never going to be your favorite. Now we have, I believe, number 14. I'll stop, num I'll stop, I'll stop numbering things. I'll stop numbering things. Number 14 is The Ark in Space. I believe that was actually based originally 
based on another script by John Lucarotti, and Robert came, you know, pretty much edited it and rewrote it, kind of. I could be wrong. Check my facts there. But the Ark in Space, very excellent script. I just, it's not his fault. I just think the directing slash editing could have been a little bit better about making the story atmospheric and the music could have found a way to make it more, you know, give you more suspense, if you will. But that's nothing wrong with his script. It's just the directing and the editing. That's the thing. But very good script. Now, we have, I think, after the, the Ark in Space, next up is The Two Doctors. Very good story to me personally. I love how weird and bizarre it is. Also, it's done some incredible things of bringing the sixth doctor and the second doctor together in one story. Yes, but also we get Jamie back. And I love Jamie, guys. I love him so much. And we got Perry still there. And also, it did something I think is very wonderful. It showed how you don't need there to be an anniversary to have a multi- Doctor story. It opened the door to all these other, I mean, a doc, there can be a multi-doctor story in the first season of a new doctor. That's great. I mean, that is a brilliant idea. I know Doctor Who is not keen on doing that very often, but I think it's a very good idea of a doctor, a previous doctor can come in at any time and be a part of a new Doctor's season. I love that we don't have to wait for a... The two Doctors broke all the rules. And that's good. I think it was a good thing that it did. It's just simply I, I don't own it. So that's why it's low on the list. I can't enjoy something I don't really own and cannot watch as much. That's just all it is, you know. That's all it is. Okay, now. What do we have next? Oh, screw the numbers. Let's go. We are now at... Guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so bad with numbers. We're now at the Crotons. Okay, the Crotons, I know a... It's gotten pretty low on some lists, um, or people are not crazy about that story. For me, I guess it's a suit, the concept of people, um, defamed it so much or gave such, you know, negative comments to it, it lowered my standards, and so I was able to really enjoy it a lot. And I liked how it really showed, um, Zoe's skills, but I... I'll be honest, guys, I just love the second Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe so much that it could be a crappy episode, and I'll be like... God, I love this story. I, I admit, guys, I, I don't know what's going on with me there. There's just something about the Doctor, Jamie, and Zoe that I have a large Achilles heel for. I can't explain it. I just love those three. Now we have next runner-up is Terra of the Utans. Now, Terra of the Utans. Terra of the Utans... I do overall very much love that story. And it brought... Again, first story, Robert Holmes wrote the very first story that gave us The Master. And we got Joe Grant. He was the first one to write Joe Grant. So we got The Master and Joe Grant. And I'm happy that both of them exist. And again, bringing back the Autons. If I said Utons before, sorry, Autons. Utons. I don't know why I say Utons. I don't know why. It just comes out. Terror of the Autons. And bring back the Autons, and they're as scary as that they ever have been. And it's a very good way of introducing a new season. I just, again, another simple concept of, I, um, I don't, I do not own it. Can't enjoy something I do not own. Next we have up is The Pyramids of Mars. Now, The Pyramids of Mars was written by Robert Holmes, but it was credited as Stephen or Stephen Harris, I believe. But it turns out it was actually written by Robert Holmes. I don't know why it was credited as Stephen Harris. I guess that's due to some type of tax problems. But Pyramids of Mars is a story I overall do like. I think Sutek is a very great villain. Sarah Jane Smith shined in that story. Um, Sutek, I said it before. I'm so sorry to reiterate. But I love the idea of Sutek because it just shows how you can have anybody, no matter how large, be the villain of a Doctor Who story. And it shows the vastness of the Doctor Who world that Sutek, an Egyptian god, is in Doctor Who. Broadens what could happen in Doctor Who. That's a very good thing. It's just simply that there were times where Tom Baker obviously had a problem with the director and um, it shows. It just shows. It shows. There's nothing we can do about that. Next we have up is The Deadly Assassin. Great story. 
I mean, The Deadly Assassin is a very good story. And also, I read the novelization of that story, and thank God I did. The novelization really helps you understand that story even more. And going into The Matrix, the world that was created for The Matrix, oh, very good stuff there. Sometimes very Hitchcock-like, but then very, like, you know, just Hunter and the Prey. It's intense. It's got a scary clown in there. It's got, oh, oh Doctor almost run over by a train. Your worst nightmares are in The Matrix. So very cool. And the master is scary to look at. He's really scary. Like, really, really, really scary. Ooh. And this is a story where we have the doctor by himself. I mean, yes, he's helped by other Time Lords, but ultimately we have a story where it's the doctor without a companion. I like this because it shows how the doctor can still, without a companion, should still be competent, reliable, and self-reliant. This is important to me, where the doctor should be able to have an adventure by himself and still be functional, even without a companion. He just prefers to have a companion with him. As, as I said in a previous video, this shows how just because the doctor is alone does not mean he's lonely. And the fourth doctor in The Deadly Assassin shows this. He can be completely alone and not be lonely. That's an important thing. Emotional independence or independence in general for the Doctor. Now, after that we have The Sunmakers. This is one of Louise Jameson, she's the actress who plays Leela, one of her favorite stories, I think if not her favorite story. Um, and Leela is just so fun in this. She gets captured, yes, but she gets captured being a badass. And the doc, and the idea of, uh, just, I love the idea, it's all about taxes. It's all about taxes! And taxes going up, and then not telling you the taxes going up, and Pluto having all these suns around it because it's so cold out there, they need these suns in geostationary orbit because the planet could get cold, so they do not know what night is or darkness. And Leela is just, and the Doctor, they are in top notch here. They both really are. And the end, where they, um, Haig, where the people who rise up, throw Haig, the tax collector, off a building and just shout, Yay! I love Because in New Who, that probably could never happen. Because, God forbid, you kill the villain. But I I'm fine with it. Cause I'm like, you know what? Sometimes you gotta kill the villain. Praise the company. No. Definitely not. Mm-hmm. So now we have... I wonder where I am in the list. Oh, well, who cares? The Talons of Wing... Chiang. This is a story that has been, you know, criticized for its political incorrectness, but well, ha ha ha. It's a good story. I'm not letting that get in the way of the fact that it's a good story. It's like how I hate how the representation of the Asian character in Breakfast at Tiffany's, but I do like everything else about Breakfast at Tiffany's. And at least with this one, um, Chan or whatever, sorry, the villain, the villain, oh, not, the, not Wing Chiang, but the woman who's working for him, um, he is a three-dimensional character who, by the end, you could argue he's quite sympathetic. He's bad, but he does have things about him that you can connect to and relate to. And just with the end, with Leela saying, after they captured the bad guy in the very, like, first episode, put him to the torture! <laughs> I love it! So politically incorrect! And when she gets dressed, she like she cuts up the meat when they're eating, and she says, she says to the guy, "It's a good knife." And he is like, "Okay, I guess I'll eat like you're eating." And they eat the meat in like a savage way together. I love it, love it. And again, Wing Chiang, very good villain, very good plot line. And the doctor, when um Lily gets dressed up so they can go to the theater together, she's wearing a lovely dress, and the doctor looks so amazed by seeing her. It's like the doctor almost like, like in his eyes, it was like, "You are so beautiful." I love you. Oh, that could just be me. Then we have next up, The Time Warrior. Yes, Robert Holmes was the first person to write the Centaurans in The Time Warrior. And this is one of my favorite um, presentations or representations of Sarah Jane Smith. I thought she was very good here. And Lynx was a very good, very good... Um, villain for this story but being set in a medieval time it gives a nice good backdrop it's it's a good story i'm not even gonna it, it's, it's just a good story sorry i'm not talking too much about this but i just don't want to go on for too long 
Next we have up The Power of Kroll. One of the least liked stories of season 16, the key to time of the fourth Doctor's era. Well, Kroll forever! I love the power of Kroll. I like, and I think Kroll, I think the special effects were very good in the power of Kroll. Kroll, to me, does look like, look like he could be there. The story is good. The idea of m m these effects superior people coming in and disrespecting the natives. I think, again, it, it never gets old. Classic. Just classic. And without Classic Who doing that as often as it did, New Who would not have that idea to keep copying, which New Who definitely has done. Yes, it has. So now we have up, I believe, is it, mm, I don't think, was it right? Hold on. Oh god, yeah, sorry. The Ribus Operation. Okay, the Ribus Operation was a story that I loved, but I did not go back and watch very often. Then one time I was doing my hair, and being a black girl, it can take us two hours to do our hair, which is the same around the same amount of time as one four-part story. So I put the Ribus Operation in, just curious one day. Oh my god. Oh my god. It's so good. <laughs> I forgot how good the Ribus Operation really is. It's a darn good story. And Benro... Benro! What a good moment! Benro! I love you, Benro! And I like the banter between Romana 1 and the 4th Doctor in this. I love the creation of the White Guardian and the Black Guardian. I like the story. The characters, the thieves, were so well acted. And, um... The, the, the tyrant, God, whose name is escaping me, um, who's absolutely insane, he was a very good villain. He was just Shakespeare with how he did his thing. Then we have next up, um, The Carnival of Monsters. Perfect story. I don't understand if people do not like it. Perfect story. Boom, boom, boom. Go moving forward. Next we have is The Caves of Andrazani. I know some people think that story is overrated. It, it, no, just, just no. It, it, it's a great story. Shiraz Cech is a fantastic villain. You sympathize with him. You connect to him. You're haunted by him. You're kind of creeped out by him. You love him as a villain. And Perry, you just really get into her quickly as a companion because of this story. This one established her as a companion very quickly. And Peter Davison's Fifth Doctor shines in this. Fifth Doctor earned his stripes. He was awesome. All of this, this whole, just to get back to Perry and save Perry. Whoa! Perfect story. And I think we're at number one right now. Sorry if I missed anything. Warn me about below if I missed a story that Robert Holmes wrote. But now we have Spearhead from Space. Probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, story of Classic Who. The first story of the third Doctor. This story, I love how it's always not expensive to buy. It introduced the Autons. Gave us the third Doctor. Gave us a Liz Shaw. Gave us Unit in full. Unit was established in the second Doctor era, but now we're going to have Unit, and we're going to have it all throughout the third Doctor's era. This is a perfect story for me. Great length, and I love me some long stories, but this story works as a four-parter very well. And people often forget that the third Doctor was the first Doctor to be naked in a sh an episode. Yeah, he was in a shower completely butt-ass naked. Oh, John Pertwee, you sexy beast. What? Yeah, I said it. Call me politically incorrect all you want to, but Spearhead from Space, excellent story. Thank you guys so much for watching. i sorry that I cannot give longer stuff, you know, talks about each story, but I just don't want to go on for too long. And my next one might be about all ranking all the stories of Terry Nation or David Whitaker, Malcolm Hawk, or the Baker and Martin Boys. It all depends upon how this all falls. So thank you guys so much for watching. And what is your favorite Robert Holmes stories? Or do you have a ranking? Let me know below. If not... Or if you have no ranking at all, just thanks for stopping by. Bye, guys.